Great. Okay, so where are we in the world of zero knowledge? We've seen the basic ideas, we've seen Sigma protocols, which are this nice class of zero knowledge proofs that you can sort of pretty easily construct and analyze. And we saw non-interactive zero knowledge, which was a little bit more involved, but um, perhaps a bit more practically useful, you could argue. And we're gonna sort of finish off the more theoretical side of things today by studying classic result from Goldreich, Mikkeli, and Wittgesen um, from 1991. This is a very famous paper in the Annals of Crypto, and it's that's not a journal name, sorry, I was just being dramatic. Um, and the main result is that every NP language has a zero knowledge proof, which they humbly state um, as proofs that yield nothing but their validity. Uh, which, sure, I guess, that is one way to say this incredible result. Okay. So, uh, in fact, this paper contains two different results. It has the, uh, the aforementioned every NP language has a zero knowledge proof. And it also has this sort of interesting study of graph isomorphism and graph non isomorphism. Uh, and the reason this paper has that is, uh, historically until then, all the known zero knowledge proofs were about number theoretic things, like is, is this a quadratic residue, um, does, what is a discrete logarithm, all the known zero knowledge proofs were about these kinds of number theory problems, and they said, hey look, we can do, we can do some graph stuff as well. Uh, but we're going to focus on this result, um, and I am cheating slightly. There is a caveat, which is that we have to assume that one-way functions exist. And this is maybe not too shocking because if they don't, if they don't exist, then crypto is in trouble. If they do exist and we can prove it, then we have a proof of P not equal NP. So uh, this, is a, this is a little wrinkle, but maybe not such a big deal. Uh, the idea is sort of the obvious thing, air quotes, that you might think to try, which is we're going to produce a zero knowledge proof for uh, an NP complete problem, namely graph three coloring. And we're going to prove that nothing goes wrong somehow if you try to use the reduction, the NP complete reduction to uh, turn this into a proof of any NP language. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just recall verbally, in case anyone who's watching later uh, needs it, the idea, an NP language is just, it's a set of strings that can be recognized in polynomial time by a non-deterministic Turing machine. And this is, of course, equivalent to a language uh, where proofs of inclusion can be checked in polynomial time. And this is kind of logically the thing that we care about when we're doing zero knowledge proofs, right? If you can't even check it in polynomial time, then what's the point? If you can't check it efficiently, then it's kind of meaningless, right? So this is arguably the, the sensible setting to do zero knowledge proofs in. Um, there's some more theory that you can study about that, but I won't go into it. Uh, and I'm gonna write down the definition of one-way functions. Um, we don't need it in too much detail, but it's nice to know. So the idea is that I take a function from bit strings to bit strings. And I say it's one way if you can't compute any pre-images. Uh, so first of all, if it has to, it has to actually be efficiently computable. So that means in polynomial time. And for all uh, polynomial, probabilistic polynomial time algorithms and all constants greater than or equal to one and a sufficiently large n. The probability that you can produce a pre-image is less than n to the power of minus c, so it's negligible. So PR x from the uniform distribution f of a of f 
of x equals f of x is less than n to the minus c. Okay, so uh, if you prove the existence of such a function, of course, you have proved p not equal np, uh, but this is a pretty standard and almost sort of philosophically the weakest assumption you can make in crypto. Uh, you can do a lot of things with one-way functions, but not quite everything, and this is uh, in some sense, the weakest sensible assumption. So we're going to do graph three coloring. So we're going to study a special case of encryption functions. Actually, we're going to use them as commitments, but that's the difference is not so important. Uh, so we only have three values, right? Three colors. Um, but we're actually going to include like a junk value, and this will be useful for uh, producing the simulator. So I'm going to define a secure encryption function now, and it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, so three colors and a junk value 0, plus a random string, and it gives me some sort of ciphertext string. We say it's a secure encryption function. if, well, it has to be efficiently computable. Again, if you can't encrypt stuff efficiently, what's the point? Uh, it's some, in some sense, we have no collisions. So if I take two different messages and two different nonces, random strings, we don't have a collision. So for all x not equal y, r not equal s, we have f of x r not equal f of y s. So x and y are the messages, r and s are the randomizing uh, values. And we have this indistinguishability criterion. The idea is basically you can't tell the difference between uh, encryptions of two different messages. So the ensemble f of x r, where r is drawn from the uniform distribution, and f of y r, where r is drawn from the uniform distribution, are uh, indistinguishable. So this just means that no efficient, no PPT algorithm can tell them apart with non-negligible probability. So the idea is if you just if you encrypt messages, you take the distribution over randomness, um, you can't tell which message is being encrypted. And we have a classic theorem, uh, which I won't prove, but I will state. It just says that one-way functions are sufficient for secure encryption functions. So there exists one-way func means that there exists a secure encryption function. You can, I think this, this is probably not too surprising, right? Somehow, I think just using the one-way function directly doesn't quite work, but the details are not so finicky, and it, it, it makes sense, right? If, I can, if there's a function that's hard to undo, then there should be a way to encrypt stuff. Okay, so that's where our assumption creeps in. Uh, our protocol is going to use this secure encryption function, and it's sufficient to assume that there exists uh, any one-way function. Okay, and to make explicit what I mean by three coloring, so I take a graph. I'm very sorry, Dan, I don't mean to condescend. I know you know all this. A graph is three colorable. Uh, G equals VE, so a set of vertices, a set of edges. If there exists some coloring function, phi from the vertices to our three colors, such that if I take any two adjacent vertices, they have a different color. So phi view, it does not equal phi of v. Okay. So famously, 
this uh, this problem, the existence of a three coloring is NP complete. So any NP problem can be reduced to an instance of three coloring uh, in polynomial time. Uh, the proof is usually done by reduc reduction to three set. So that will come up a bit later. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to prove for some graph that there exists three coloring. To be more careful, I take a graph for which there exists a three coloring and I prove that there exists a three coloring in zero knowledge. So I prove to you, the verifier, that I have a three coloring, uh, but I don't reveal anything about what that three coloring is. And the protocol is actually very sim sim similar to the colorblind friend example that we discussed right at the very beginning. Uh, we're essentially going to shuffle the vertices and then we're going to encrypt all the vertices and the verifier will ask us to reveal some edge and check and the verifier will check that this is uh, a consistent coloring. Okay, so protocol. This is so cool. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Sorry, Dan? I said, this is so cool. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, it's Go. super cool. And it's a really, it's a really simple, neat idea. Mm. Uh, really, if you want to carefully prove that this all works, it gets a bit technical, but it's a really simple idea and it's super cool that it just works. So what's the prover going to do? Um, the prover is going to choose a random permutation. Call the permutation pi from the symmetric group of three elements. Uh, recall, this is just the set of bijections on, th on one, two, three under composition. Uh, so choose a permutation and a bunch of random nonsense, right? We're going to encrypt every vertex. Uh, we're going to encrypt the color of every vertex. So we need a bunch of random values, one for each vertex. All right, like this, I have R indexed by V drawn from zero, one to the length of V. Uh, recall, you cannot draw uniformly from an infinite from the set of infinite strings, so we're bounding it by the number of vertices for each vertex. And then what do we do? Of course, we encrypt them and send the encryptions to the verifier. So as a tuple, because the verifier needs to know which vertex is which, f of pi of v of v, comma rv. So f is our encryption function, just to be clear. Uh, for each v in v. Okay, I'm going to switch color because we want to keep track of who's doing what. So blue will be our verifier. So the verifier is just going to sample a random edge. And send it to the prover. What's the prover going to do? The prover is now going to decrypt that edge, right? So I've got an edge and I know what I encrypted for each end of the edge and I'm going to send that back to the verifier. Uh, in, in modern terms, we call this opening the commitment. If you look at GMW, the, the old school paper, they don't talk about sort of, that we, that we didn't have this notion of commitments back then, but really what you're doing, the, the prover is committing to, let me, outline that. The prover here, this is a commitment to a color for the vertex, right? Um, when the verifier reveals both this, in, this message and this nonce, then the verifier can check that the encryption is consistent. So this is a commitment and a reveal step. Okay, so, whoops. So the prover has an edge and we'll call this u comma v. And it sends the opening. In other words, the permuted color that we assign to u plus the nonce for both ed for both vertices. Okay, so we just send the opening. That's it. And what's the verifier going to do? Dead simple. The verifier checks that this is a legit opening and that they do indeed have different colors. So it checks the values consistent. 
me step one and that the colors are different. Okay. And then we repeat this equal to the number of edges squared times. And the verifier accepts if every single round worked out correctly. Uh, so we can see already, this, this sort of has the shape of a sigma protocol, right? Um, this is a commitment. Sorry, can I just check? When you say yeah, don't go step ahead. four checks it's consistent with step one, meaning that... Mm -hmm. oh, what does that mean? So the verifier has this tuple of values. Yeah. And then has these two values, right? Oh, without the F. Uh, yeah, so, okay. um, applying F gives the same value. Right? Uh, sort of so, uh, an interesting subtlety here. The encryption function is deterministic, right? But it takes a, a, random, a randomizing factor. So if you know the randomizing factor, it's deterministic. So the verifier can check that the encryption is correct. OK. So this has our, our traditional three-move structure, right? The prover is committing to some col a coloring. The verifier is sending a challenge. And the prover is sending a response. Uh, this is not, however, a sigma protocol. Um, it fails the uh, special soundness property. You can't, two rounds are not enough to extract knowledge here. So we're going to have to analyze it a little bit differently. OK, so why does this work? Um, intuitively, let's suppose that the verifier, that, that the graph is in fact not three callable. Then no matter what the prover does, this encryption here is going to, um, th there's always going to be at least one pair of vertices in these encryptions that have the same color, right? If it's not three colorable, the prover has to make sure that that has to happen at some point. And the verifier is choosing an edge at random. So if there's one edge where they have the same color, there's a probability one over the number of edges that the verifier chooses the edge that catches the prover cheating. And that gives us a soundness error. That gives us a soundness. Yeah, this gives us a soundness error of one minus one over the number of edges. Not very big, but if we repeat it number of edges squared times, this is roughly exponential. So we have uh, a negligible probability of getting away with cheating. On the other hand, why is it zero knowledge? Well, if we look at what does the prover actually, what does the verifier actually get, right? The verifier gets a random permutation, right? This is a permutation and it was chosen uniformly at random. The verifier gets a random permutation of a three coloring. So because the permutations are different in every round, the verifier can't correlate rounds together to learn the three coloring. That's the idea. And because it's random, it's simulatable. The general a, a general strategy in crypto is if something is randomly chosen, then you can probably simulate it. Okay, so let's try to prove that. Theorem. This protocol is zero knowledge. And it's existentially sound. It's not knowledge sound, it's only existentially sound. So recall the difference is knowledge soundness gives you a notion somehow that the prover knows a three coloring. Not only does do you, are you sure there exists one, you're sure the prover knows it. Um, if we can only prove existential soundness, then the only thing we're absolutely convinced of is that there is a three coloring. Maybe there is some way that the prover could somehow prove this without having a three coloring, right? A cheating prover that isn't following the protocol somehow could do this. Um, we don't know. Uh, 
I haven't, I didn't have a chance to look carefully through the research. Maybe someone has a knowledge sound three coloring, um, but we're only going to do existential soundness for this one. Did I cut you off at some point, Dan? It sounded like you were going to say something. No, no, that's clear. Thank you. No, good, good. Okay, proof. So soundness is clear. So a fake proof or f a, a fake proof by which I mean a proof of a false statement. In other words, a proof where there is no three coloring. So a false proof in each round is accepted with probability at most the reciprocal of the number of edges. So over all rounds is accepted the probability at most one minus 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 at most sorry, at most one minus right sorry about that okay uh probability at most this to the power of the number of edges squared which is about x minus number of edges. Easy. So there's a negligibly small chance that a false proof is accepted. Very good. Now we have to produce a simulator, a zero knowledge simulator. So we assume, recall, we assume that we're given an efficient verifier. This might not be the verifier I specified in the protocol. This is any algorithm that uh, sort of conforms type-wise to, the, to the, the protocol. So it's going to produce some edge, but it may not be uniformly at random. And we're going to construct simulator S, so ZK. Let calligraphic V be the verifier. And we construct a simulator S. Okay, so we're going to do the classic thing. We're going to define uh, round by round. So in each round, what is the simulator going to do? Okay, so it's going to start by choosing a random edge. It has to, it, the simulator has to somehow produce encryptions that seem legit. In other words, if the verifier, the, the encryptions the verifier opens have to actually be a legit three coloring, or they have to, um, they have to have different, uh, they have to have different colors, right? If whatever the verifier opens has to have different colors. So the simulator is going to try to guess what the verifier is going to issue as the challenge, right? The simulator is going to guess ahead of time which edge it has to open, and it's just going to construct its ciphertexts. Uh, in such a way that that edge is always legit when it's opened. So the simulator can't be caught cheating just by construction. Okay, so the first step is that the S simulator is going to guess the edge. Just choosing uniformly at random is good enough. So I fix edges, uh, vertices U and V. And it's just going to choose two random values that are not equal uh, two random colors, I should say, that are not equal. So that's just in our color set squared such that they're not equal. Okay, hopefully you agree that I'm not cheating. You really can sample this. Um, what, why is, what are the two colors? Well, these are the two colors we're going to give to our guest vertices. Why does that work? Because the real prover chooses a random permutation. So if we just choose two random different colors, that's the same thing as choosing a random permutation of the actual colors. Okay, we define for each i, for each vertex i, uh, I can't use v because I already used v. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ci, the color of the i, is going to be 
the obvious thing, yeah? If I, if we're coloring U, we choose A. If we're coloring B, we choose V. Sorry, if we're coloring V, we choose B. And otherwise, we just choose zero. So zero is not a real color, but that's no problem because because we guessed which edge is going to be opened, we're never going to open an encryption of zero, so it doesn't matter. Okay, now the simulator is going to run the verifier on this input and it gets a challenge. On F C I R I. where the RIs are just uniformly randomly chosen, right? Okay, so when I say run on, what I mean is the simulator is going to run an instance of the verifier. It's going to emulate, if you like, an instance of the verifier. And the challenge it issues the verifier is, these, uh, is the encryption of these CIs that it's uh, decided. And it gets a challenge. That's just a random edge, or that's an edge. Uh, again, the verifier might be cheating, so it might not actually be random. And if we got lucky, if E equals UV, um, what's the simulator going to do? It's trying to produce a transcript. So it's just got a legit transcript because it guessed the edge, and it's just going to add that. So the transcript contains the commitment F-C-I-R-I for I in V, the challenge, and the opening, C-U-R-U, C-V-R-V, -V, to the transcript, and otherwise, what's the simulator going to do? It's just going to try again. Okay, so in each round, the simulator is going to try to guess what the verifier is going to produce as the edge. Uh, if it guessed correctly, it moves on to the next round. Otherwise, it just repeats this round. So we have to prove two things, right? We have to prove that the simulator is efficient, and we have to prove that it correctly, um, it gets the right distribution of the protocol transcripts. Okay, why is it efficient? Well... Intuitively, if the verifier, if the, the verifier is cheating in such a way that it makes sure the simulator's guess is never correct, then it has to choose dependent on the simulator's guess. That intuitively, that, that's the only thing it can do, right? The simulator can't get super unlucky unless the verifier is somehow learning its guess because the simulator chooses a different guess every attempt. What, how could the verifier do this? Well, the, the only information it gets are encryptions of the simulator's guess. Um, and, and how does it get that, by the way? It gets it because every other thing is an encryption of zero. So if the verifier could somehow force the simulator to get caught, uh, sorry, if the verifier could somehow make the simulator reset too many times, then the verifier must be able to break encryption. Okay, so it's a reduction to the security of the encryption function. Uh, I'm going to write this out because I think it's more convincing if I do. So I'm going to define M U V A B. This is just the, the message that the simulator sends parameterized by its choices of U, V, A, and B. So that's the C, the, the, the colorings. Sorry, it's the, it's the, it's it's the the thing that the simulator sends, but not encrypted, just to make things easier. And I'm gonna need a name for the vector of random values that the simulator has. And what we're going to do is we're gonna show that you can choose any other edge you want and substitute it and the verifier can't really tell. Okay. So for all ST, that's another edge. We have the probability 
where UV AB are uniformly sampled, that the verifier on the encryption of these values uh, produces the edge that we want. We're going to bound this below. Um, note that I'm doing sort of a classic computer scientist thing. The F is defined on elements. This is a sequence, so I can just lift F to sequences. Um, this is a classic thing because otherwise writing it would be a disaster. Uh, what's this equal to? Well, since U and V are chosen uniformly at random, this is simply a weighted sum for each U, V, and E. probability over A and B of the verifier doing the thing. This is just the same expression in the brackets as before. Now, this is greater than the probability that the verifier would guess correctly on any other thing. Uh, I should note if I look at the previous board real quick, I want to call this star, sorry, I forgot. Um, this is going to be greater than probability over each edge da, da, da. so now I'm going to swap the edges around and by the security of the encryption the verifier can't get much advantage out of me changing the edges so S, T, A, B, same random values, uh, brackets equals U, V, minus 1 over V squared. Where does this term come from? Uh, this is N to the minus C for sufficiently large n, which is the number of vertices. Okay, so um, I'm invoking security of encryption here um, just by definition. And also uh, a technical point, this has to be consistent with star. So what I mean is, literally what you're doing is you're taking star and you're swapping U and V for S and T, right? The zeros are the same everywhere else. Okay, so, so this is just invoking security of encryption. The paper cites a lemma from a much older paper, which is completely incomprehensible. Um, but you could write, sort of just write this out as a reduction if you wanted. Okay. But this is simply, this is greater than, take out the constant, and I use a bound on the number of, uh, the number of edges versus the number of vertices. Maybe you see where this is going. Oops, I got my brackets wrong. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so it's just a well-known bound, right? If you you can't have too many ed yeah, you can't have too many edges for a fixed number of vertices, and um, this is going to be equal to. Note that we're summing up here. Summing up here, so this is going to, I have a typo in my notes, but that's fine. Note that we're summing up here, so we're just summing over all edges. So in other words, this is just the probability that the verifier's guess lands in the edge set.
minus this constant, which is, of course, just the constant, because this is one. Okay, so what have we proven? We have proven each round takes at most two times the number of edges attempts. Which means that the runtime is bounded by two times the number of edges cubed. Therefore, it's fully time. Hmm. Any questions, Dan? No, that made sense. Mm -hmm. So I decided to make this a bit more explicit than usual because it's it's neat enough that you can really do it. Uh, a lot of the time, papers will do much faster and, loose, faster and looser reasoning. But um, this is not too bad. OK. So we reduce, I, I, I just want to stress, we had to assume that secure encryption exists in order to do this. Good. So now we have to prove that the transcript distribution is right. Okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, you can try to read the paper if you want, I dare you. Um, it's quite, <laughs> quite involved and very technical. Fortunately, from the modern point of view, we have uh, a much cleaner technique to prove this kind of thing. Um, I'm following Vipul Goyal from MIT uh, and Colin Kelly, uh, who took notes on his course. That's linked in the Discord. Um, and this is, this is a classic crypto thing called a hybrid argument. Okay, and the idea is, what are we actually trying to do? We're, tr we're saying we've got a conversation of sorts between the simulator and the verifier. And this is some kind of transcript. And we want to prove that it's indistinguishable from a run of the prover with the same verifier. So this is sort of hard to reason about directly. So we're going to do it in a series of steps, right? I'm going to, I'm going to construct something, an S. Uh, I'm going to construct... I'm reading my notes because my notation is all over the place yet. I got this a little bit backwards, but that's fine. I'm going to construct a simulator called S1. Whoops. And another simulator called S2. And I'm going to construct these in such a way that to prove the indistinguishability in steps is easy. And then we have the result by transitivity. So this is called a hybrid argument. The idea is you change, you change the proving protocol a little bit at each step until you land at the design simulator. OK. So uh, I define S1 as follows. This is going to first guess an edge. And then it's going to simulate an interaction between the prover and verifier repeatedly until uh, the edge that was chosen in the challenge is the edge that we expect and output the result. Uh, by the same argument as before, this is still an efficient simulator. Okay. S2 is going to do the same thing, except for every encryption that isn't opened, it's going to replace it with an encryption of zero. But replace encryptions. For I 
in the set of vertices minus C or anything with an encryption of zero. Okay, so the picture is the real prover is uh, indistinct. The real prover is indistinguishable from S one. Why? Because they are literally the same transcript, right? Just by definition, they're the same transcripts. And because the ch because UV is chosen uniformly at random, the fact that we're sort of rigging it somehow doesn't matter because they're still uniformly random in both cases. So, P V. Whoops. PUV is clear. Similarly, let's consider S2. Well, that's the same thing as the simulator, right? Because it's choosing a random permutation of any two colors and the simulator S is choosing two random colors. These are the same thing. So S2 V indistinguishable from, I just wrote an isomorphism symbol I meant to use. I meant to use approximately equal, but we can call this isomorphism if we want. This is also immediate. The, un the one that's not completely trivial is S1 to S2, so let's look at that. Okay. So the idea is if you can distinguish the transcripts, then you have to be able to tell the difference between encryptions of zero and some other value. Why? because uh, S1 never encrypts zero and S2 never opens encryptions of zero. So because S1 never encrypts zero, this is the only way you could tell them apart that in fact, it's the only way they differ, but S2 never opens encryptions of zero. So you have to be able to break the encryption function. So the only difference is S2 encrypt. Encryptions so distinguishing transcripts implies breaking the encryption function. That's it. We have the right transcript distribution. They're not equal, but they are computationally indistinguishable or they're indistinguishable assuming that the encryption function is secure. So we have a zero knowledge proof for graph three coloring. What did we use from the theory we developed to do this? You kind of bypassed it somehow, right? Uh, could you explain that in more detail? Well, we didn't use, I mean, it wasn't a Sigma protocol. Mm -hmm. So we, how much of what we discussed up until this lecture did we need for this argument? Could we have done this in the first lecture? Yeah, absolutely. We could have done this in the first lecture. Um, the reason that I, the reason that I think it makes sense to come back to this now is because these kinds of zero knowledge protocols are pretty artificial. It's like I'm proving a mathematical statement who cares question mark it's <laughs> neat but mm. it's less sort of we don't have like a concrete motivating practical reason like we do with sigma protocols right and Let's i see. think the most natural setting of zero knowledge proofs is in proofs of knowledge at least from the modern perspective it's in proofs of knowledge and then we have to sort of step back and say well existential soundness sometimes makes sense too and now we're using this idea of existential soundness uh, also, so these simulators and yeah. uh, sort of this simulator is sort of a lot more abstract somehow than the one for Sigma protocols, right? Um, mm. So I, you don't need this theory, but I think it I think it makes more sense if you sort of have a feel already for how zero knowledge proofs practically run. Mm. 
if you're doing if you're just doing like a if you're doing a a models a theory a, a theory of computer science lecture right then a lecture series then you could just slot this in i think without much trouble without needing to talk much about crypto even yeah this is um, super stick yeah uh it's it's definitely one of those results that seems obvious mm. once you know it <laughs> okay so let's let's finish it off Theorem. Every NP language has a zero knowledge proof. Why is this not immediate, Dan? Do you have any idea? Okay, so an NP language, so that's. So there's a polynomial time reduction to, to the three coloring problem. What could go wrong? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so we've got our NP language L. By NP completeness. There is an efficiently computable. Reduction. Which I'm going to write as T from L to G3C. G3C for graph three coloring. So what's the protocol? It's dead simple, right? The protocol, I should say, so I need to set up some notation for X in L. So we're going to, the statement we're proving is that X is an element of L prover and the verifier, computer graph by playing t to x and run g3c and I claim soundness is immediate. So there's no problem with soundness. Zero knowledge. How are we going to construct a zero knowledge simulator? <laughs> so the problem is we proved the G3C is zero knowledge, assuming that you're given T of X, right? But in this protocol, you're given both X and T of X. So the proof doesn't carry because you have some extra information. Mm. Uh -huh. So, how are we going to deal with this extra information? Dan, do you have a guess? <laughs> no idea. No idea, yeah. So this is the wart, right? This is sort of, it is not immediate because the zero knowledge property, I mean, the protocol's different. You have extra information. Maybe a cheating verifier could abuse this extra information somehow um, to learn the um, the, the graph three coloring, right? Here's the trick. Not only is there an com inefficiently computable reduction from L to G3C, actually, there's an invertible reduction to three sat. Okay, Th three sat is Boolean satisfiability with three variables. How does that reduction go? Essentially, L is NP, so you produce your non-deterministic Turing machine, and then you encode um, you encode its final state as a, satis a Boolean satisfiability problem. This is immediately it's it's somehow immediately clear that this is invertible. And also, the reduction, the standard reduction for graph three coloring, proving that it's NP complete, is also invertible, and you reduce it to three sat. So, in fact. The reduction from L to graph three coloring is also invertible. Why is this good? Because now we can argue, okay, well, any any cheating verifier could anyway compute X given T of X. So what does our simulator do? It just runs the thing 
on t of x um, because it it just it can just compute it. I'm gonna write this out a little bit. Um, so we have uh, for z k we have our prover p and our dishonest verifier v hat. So we define this is another sort of hybrid argument v one which takes t of x, computes x using the inversion, and, oh, sorry, I got this backwards. Gave away the, I gave away the game slightly here. So I have v1, which takes x, and interacts with the prover uh, for the graph 3 coloring. Note that P um, contains an instance of P G3C. On T of X using, so V1 is, is simulating an instance of the original V um, by ca calculating T of X. And then perhaps it's doing something to try to extract the graph isomorphism from this interaction using the fact that it knows X as well. And then I, I take my V2, which is going to take T of X, compute that inverse, And then it runs v1 on x. So let's observe what v2 is. It takes t of x. That means that it's a verifier for graph 3 coloring, right? Because it just takes the graph. So v2 is a legit verifier for graph 3 coloring. So by ZK for G3C, there is a simulator S, I call this SG3C, that runs on V2 because V2 is legit verifier for this thing. And now we finally define our original simulator in terms of V hat. Uh, it receives x. I wrote this a bit clunkily in my notes. Note that this. Uh, oh, I've got lines. <laughs> Note that this also gets t of x. Right, because it, it needs to know the statement that is supposed to be being proved. Sorry to interrupt, Eleanor. Uh, I'm going to have to leave exactly at nine today, unfortunately, um, for something yep, else. Nope, but... that's fine. We are essentially done. <laughs> so we define our simulator for our original verifier as literally just this simulator. And we observe that the transcripts are identical. just by construction. So the idea is because the reductions are invertible, we can sort of do some trickery to convert our original cheating verify into one for graph three coloring, which we have a simulator for. And then um, we can just reinterpret that as a simulator for the original dishonest verifier. That's it. We have zero knowledge proof for every NP problem. This is often not practical, right? Um, the reductions, I mean, the polynomial time, but are they like practically efficient? Maybe they, they take forever to compute in, in real, the real world or they use a ton of space. So um, 
next week, my plan is to talk more about how to do this kind of thing, this kind of generic ZKP um, in a more practically computable sense. So we're going to talk about snarks and stocks. Oh, cool. Um, I've heard of those. Great. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks a thanks, lot, Eleanor. Dan. That was very clear. Great. I'll see, see you next time. time. Bye.